then eventually the Air Force made all the classification markings you had to have it on it. <coughs> so he happened to be at home and he was studying for a mission, so he did what you're not supposed to do, which is take your classified manuals home. But you keep them under lock and key when you're at home. So when he was coming into the squadron, he stopped at the local McDonald's to have breakfast and he because he didn't want to leave his checklist, which was secret, in the car, he took it with him. So anyway, he got back in the car, drove to the squadron, and about the time he got to the squadron, he walked in, and the desk officer is looking at him, looks at him and said, hey, BC, you missing anything? And he said, what? He said, that was a call from the McDonald's manager in Marysville. He said, he found in one of his booths a a checklist marked secret with your name on it. So he said, tell you what, he said, we have a backup crew for the mission you're going to fly. I'll tell them they're going to fly. You go back to Marysville, pick it up, and he ended up being grounded for 30 days. But it's one of the, like I said, sometimes sometimes things happen and all like that. But uh, at least the guy in Marysville was, you know, a nice guy, and apparently he just said, oh, okay, there was those guys in the orange flight suit. Oh, they must be from Beale. So basically he called the command post at Beale and all like that, and they sent him to the squadron. The interesting part was, it turned out, one of the operations clerk for the first, op first strategic reconnaissance squadron tried to sell the flight manual to the Russian embassy. He ended up 20 years in federal prison. And the maintenance guys at Beale basically wanted to put a contract out on him. Yeah, I remember that. Because they said he would have turned that over to the Russians as some of the guys he worked with might have ended up being killed because of that. So they were that mad about it. But uh, so am I right? Well, so it was, it was quite interesting. <laughs> uh, like I said, it's, at one time there were a number of things that were classified about the airplane. We went from the black world into the gray world, so a lot of stuff was declassified. But there were a few things that were still classified, so uh, you, you had to safeguard those. So I was, I was getting the SR ready to fly it from Edwards back here, <clears throat> and we had our canopies open because we were doing our pre-flight work, and I heard this <clears throat> from behind me, and I turned around, and it was the entire Thunderbirds team. They had just gotten F-16s, and they said, is there any chance we could get a look inside your cockpit? Mm -hmm. And I said, if only my dad was here, because he used to collect the Thunderbirds autographs oh. for me at air show. Even when I was in the Air Force, he said, really, Dad, you don't need to do that. So I said, if only my dad was here. So I said, wait a minute, I have to cover certain things in the cockpit, and then I'll let you do it. And I had to close the rear canopy, which is my office, because it has most of the secret stuff in it. So then I took them up there and showed it to them. So I said, I wish I'd had someone with a camera that could have taken a picture and sent it to my dad. But uh, the funny part was that people that look at the SR-71 cockpit say it looks like a steam locomotive. I said, there's two reasons for it. It was designed in 1959. I said, if you looked in the cockpit of an F-104 Starfighter, you'd see certain common aspects because it's a Lockheed airplane and different companies had certain things they like to put in the cockpit and after a while I got so you could put me in a cockpit with my eyes closed open my then say open your eyes and within about a minute and a half I could tell you which company made the airplane just because of certain quirks. General Dynamics had some, but Donald Douglas had some, Lockheed had some. But I said, the real reason it looks like a steam locomotive is because we wear pressure suits with big gloves. It's like wearing mittens and all the teeny little switches you guys have on your, your glass cockpits and all like that. I said, we can't feel anything. <laughs> we can't touch buttons. I was asked to evaluate an emergency radio in the SR-71. And they, and they said, yeah, we, we really want you to check it out and all like that. So I said, yeah, I'd be glad to do it and all like that. But I looked at the radio and it looked like it came out of a Cessna 172. Little tiny knobs and switches and all like that. And I said, well, this is going to be really interesting. So anyway, I flew the mission. So at the end of the mission, opened the canopy, and there's the flight test engineer right there. He said, Bill, how did it go? And all like that. I said, the radio worked great. 
said, however, it's going to need a little work. And I handed him the two knobs of the radio that I'd broken off in flight because I could not feel anything while I was changing it. And I said, that's why we have such big switches and knobs, because when you're wearing a pressure suit, you have no tactile sensation. They actually gave me a very early 1980 version of a touch screen, basically, for the nav system. It used laser beams running across the screen, and you basically touched things in order to activate them and all like that. But the problem was, you're wearing mittens. You can't even see where your finger is. So as a result, you keep activating the wrong thing. <laughs> you couldn't feel the button. There was no tactile sensation. And these stupid little laser beams on that cross there and all like that only had a vague idea of where your finger was anyway. So I said, this won't work. So now, of course, we have voice actuated. And now the F-35 cockpit has a giant glass screen, which is touchscreen technology, et cetera. And I said, touchscreen can be really interesting when you're pulling 9Gs. <laughs> so I said, I really want to see how well the touchscreen does with 9Gs. But that's why we're in the flight test. Because sometimes the engineers will come up with what seems like an absolutely brilliant idea. You say, really nice try, but I think it's going to need a little bit of work. And that, that was, to me, one of the best examples I could think of. Yeah. But anyway, uh, like I said, uh, so hopefully uh, Ray talked to you about the video and all like that. And you can 